absolutely love doing this talk because it's purely clinical. It's just a great clinical talk and allows me to bring out some, some clinical points. And what I'm going to cover is not all of thyroidology. I want to cover some uh, subtle aspects of thyroid disease, uh, that being subclinical disease, uh, what it is, what it isn't. And the uh, question again, I get asked a lot about primary care docs. You know, I love going to supermarkets, uh, not so much to do the shopping, but and try this sometime when you're, when you're in the checkout line. Just look at people's necks. You'd be amazed at what you see in there sometimes. And it really makes you wonder. You know, again, watching uh, NBC National News, there's a female reporter that uh, comes on just about every evening, and I would just love to reach through the TV and say, what about that two centimeter nodule in your right thyroid? And it's obvious, and, and you, you wonder sometimes. Uh, but go to the supermarket, look at people's necks, and you'd be amazed at what you see. Thyroid nodules are common. Autopsy studies would suggest that 60% of the population has one, so you may not have one, but I guarantee you the person sitting be beside you does. How many of them are clinically obvious? About 5%, but you're not going to find them if you don't put the fingers on the neck. And that's actually, uh, and here's actually another one that you wonder about. My partner, uh, David, figures prominently in a lot of my talks, but Michelangelo was a real nut for, uh, for anatomic detail, and you wonder again, could there have been now, examining the thyroid, I want to start with how we examine the thyroid because what I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides maybe is a little different than what you were taught in medical school. How do we examine the thyroid gland? And uh, we examine a little bit differently. You've been taught, and remember medical school will go behind and you feel the thyroid gland, but the most sensitive uh, area in your hands is not your fingertips, it's your thumb pads. So if you can use the thumb pads, you might be able to pick up uh, things a little bit better. And this is how we examine the thyroid, is we examine from the front, not from the back. And I warn the patient up front, say, be careful, uh, this is uncomfortable, it's not very nice, uh, you're going to give them to water to swallow, and sometimes they spit it up at you, and if it's done properly, by the time they leave your office, they've got nice red marks here where you've examined the thyroid. But what we do is, with one hand, we stabilize, we go in from the front, and we stabilize the uh, one side of the thyroid with our thumb. Our fingers are wrapped around behind the sternocleidomastoid. And then with the other hand, you go in and you pinch the contralateral gland between the sternocleidomastoid and between your thumb. So you've stabilized it on one side, you're pinching with the other side, and you get the patient to swallow. And when you try this, you'll be amazed at what you can feel sometimes. Uh, nodules pop up, you can feel them right down to a centimeter in size, maybe sometimes a little smaller and a thin neck. Uh, it really is a great way to examine the thyroid gland. You know, we see uh, a lot of thyroid nodules in our clinic that are constantly set up from people elsewhere in the clinic, and it amazes me at probably, uh, oh gosh, a good, if I had to pick a specialty within the clinic that sends us the most thyroid nodules, I would pick gynecology. And you often wonder, now, what's a gynecologist doing in the neck? But their fingers are so sensitive, and they can pick up these nodules right down to a centimeter in size in a heartbeat, and they fire them up to us to get it looked at. So the point here is examine, go at it. You will find it in 5% of your population. I've just shown you an alternate way of examining it. You might want to try it in a thinner individual. Uh, it really is an easy way to feel a thyroid gland. But you know, if all else fails, go back to what we were taught in medical school. At least put your fingers on the neck because you'd be amazed at what you pick up in there. And then when you're standing in the supermarket, start looking at the necks because you, you'd be amazed at what you see in some of these, some of these folks in the supermarket. That's enough about examining. A little bit of basic physiology now before I get into to, uh, to disease. And as you all know, the thyroid gland is controlled with the classic uh, uh, negative loop feedback. You can't do an endocrine talk without putting up at least one negative loop feedback. Uh, TRH from the hypothalamus, of course, stimulates the thyrotrope to produce uh, TSH, which feeds back to the thyroid gland, uh, turns on T4 and T3 production. T3 is actually what's metabolically active. Uh, we automatically will convert T4 to T3 peripherally, and this feeds back up to the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Real nice negative feedback loop. But bear in mind that this is not a linear relationship. It's a log linear relationship. So that small changes in a T4 or T3 will translate to bigger changes in the TSH. The pituitary reads uh, incredibly small changes in thyroid levels peripherally. So you may see a number of instances where your T4 levels are normal, and yet your TSH is too high or too low. And you scratch your head and you say, well, what am I supposed to believe here? Believe the pituitary gland. It's reading what's going on and gives you information long before a T4 or T3 ever will. And this is important when I come on to subclinical thyroid disease. 
Now, what tests do we have available for checking thyroid levels? And boy, the menu you get to pick from is huge. You got total or uh, T3, total T4, you got free values, you got T3 rosin uptake, the free T7 index, I think it's called, TBG thyroid, I mean, you name it, you got a lot of stuff you can pick from, and they all have their place in thyroidology. You can measure thyroid antibodies, uh, antimicrosomal, antithyroglobulin, TPO antibodies, they're useful if you're trying to pick up Hashimoto's. Thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins are useful, uh, or TRABs are useful if you're picking up Graves' disease. Thyroglobulin, we use that to follow thyroid cancers. We can measure calcitonin, which comes from C cells in the thyroid and has absolutely nothing to do with the thyroid otherwise. We can measure genes, uh, red oncogenes, uh, screening for medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. So we got a lot of things that we can measure. But the question that's in front of you when you're seeing the majority of your patients is, is there too much or is there too little? How is that gland functioning? That's what I want to know. And I would submit that uh, to this, there are only two or three tests that you need to order. You can get a total uh, or a free T4. Nowadays, we pretty much all use a free T4. And if question period, we might be able to address that a little bit later. But you can measure the amount of T4 floating around. You can measure the amount of T3 floating around. But I would tell you that probably the single most important test we have to assess thyroid function is right here, sensitive TSH. Uh, it's now uh, supplanted just about all other thyroid function tests in terms of giving you information, too much or too little. It's easily done now in any lab in the country. It's reproducible and gives you invaluable information, as, as you probably are all aware. Now, the TSH is useful to diagnose hyperthyroidism. It's a, a sensitive TSH. In hypothyroidism, it doesn't matter what TSH assay you use because the hypothyroidism, the TSH is going to be high. But it's where the sensitive TSH is helpful is in diagnosing hyperthyroid patients. Bear in mind where does TSH come from? It comes from the pituitary gland. If you don't have a pituitary or if there's pituitary dysfunction for other reasons, that may affect the TSH. And I still get consults every six months or so from the neurosurgeons saying, fix this fellow's hyperthyroidism because the TSH is low. And I send it back and say, remember that pituitary you took out six months ago? It doesn't have any TSH. You need to measure a free T4. So when you're measuring a TSH, it's useful for hyperthyroidism. The sensitive TSH uh, picks up values right down to 0.01 or lower. But keep in the back of your mind where it's coming from. Is there any pituitary pathology? And I'll come back to this in just a little bit. Completely asymptomatic lady comes into your office, no physical findings, no goiter, nothing. She feels well, she looks well, she's in for a well woman check. And this is what you've got. TSH that's slightly elevated, a free T4 that's normal, total T4 that's normal. The question I put out is, are you going to investigate this and are you, uh, are you going to treat this? And this tells us that you've got about a 50-50 split. So let me write this down because I want to come back to it later. Now, while we're here, her twin sister then walks into the office, and uh, come back to your point, and we got the opposite. He, she feels well, she looks well, you don't find anything on examination. Her TSH is slightly suppressed. Her free T4 is normal, her total T4 is completely normal. Are you going to uh, investigate or treat, uh, more importantly, are you going to treat this lady? And it looks like, got a, again, about a 50-50 split, 57-43, uh, uh, yes, no. Okay, we'll come back to this at the end of this talk. I'm going to ask exactly the same question, and we'll see if things have changed at all. It's kind of an interesting, interesting exercise. And I'm going to start first then with subclinical hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid. Now, what is subclinical hypothyroidism? By definition, these folks have no symptoms. They feel well. They look well. You would never know that they have a problem coming into the office. Uh, their TSH, however, is elevated, usually in the 5 to 10 range. They have a normal T4, normal T3, be it free T4, total T3, uh, whatever uh, variant on that you want to measure is completely normal. So all you've got is an asymptomatic individual with no physical findings and the TSH is slightly elevated. How common is this? And I guarantee you, all the primary care docs in the office have seen this, and you've seen it a lot. In England, uh, uh, studies have shown that it's 7.5% of women, 2.5% of men across all age groups have a TSH in that 5 to 10 range. There was a big Colorado study that was done here and published a few years ago, uh, looking at 25,000 patients around the state of Colorado, and the median age was 56. 10% of them had a TSH that was elevated. Interestingly, those taking thyroid hormone, one in five of them had a TSH that was elevated. So we weren't treating properly. We weren't giving enough thyroid in, in one in five of those individuals taking thyroid hormone. But older women seem to have a much higher prevalence. Uh, up to one quarter of women in senior citizen centers uh, may have a TSH that's elevated. Framingham studies would suggest somewhere around 15% of women over the age of 60 have an elevated TSH. 
But all taken together, some easier numbers to kind of park in the back of your mind is that perhaps across the board, 10% of the population uh, may have an elevated TSH, and it's particularly much more common in women over the age of 60. Up to 20% of them uh, uh, will have an elevated TSH. So this is not stuff that, that uh, is, is uncommon and you're going to see once in your practice lifetime. This is stuff you're probably seeing on a weekly basis. Now, so what? They, they feel well, they look well, their TSHA is elevated. Are there any consequences to this? And yes, there are consequences. There is an inverse relationship between thyroid and lipids. And when you look here at total cholesterol levels versus TSH, the range we're talking about or I'm talking about is right in here that this is higher than an individual who has normal uh, TSH values. And in fact, compared to the youth thyroid individual, LDL tends to be 4 or 5% higher, the HDL is about the same, and triglycerides tend to be a bit higher. Now, does this translate to cardiac disease? That's another issue, and I've got some, some data to show that. But nevertheless, lipids and thyroid go together. When one goes down, the other goes up. Don't interpret a total cholesterol until the thyroid levels have, have uh, come into focus. But in terms of thyroid, subclinical thyroid disease and cardiovascular outcomes, uh, there are some studies out there that try and address is this of significance or not. But the problem is, is that they're uh, all observational studies, meta-analyses, and here's uh, one that was published in the uh, AGM back a few years ago, that in patients with a TS subclinical hypothyroidism with a TSH modestly elevated, there did appear to be uh, increased incidence of uh, coronary heart disease, and when you adjust for other risk factors, that actually bumps up a little bit higher, and nevertheless, there was a statistically significant link with subclinical thyroid disease and cardiovascular events. And the conclusion out of this large meta-analysis was there is a link, but it, what's not clear is whether or not treatment is going to affect this link uh, or not. When you look at all-cause mortality and circulatory mortality, again, another observational meta-analysis, and there, here we do not have a clear direction from studies that are out there. The results are discrepant, they're kind of no clear association. Um, perhaps uh, with hypothyroidism, uh, we're following these patients better, maybe that's why they do better, it's, it's hard to say. And again, there's no indication as to whether or not treatment is gonna affect all cause or circulatory mortality. So I think it's safe based on the studies we have to say yes, there may be a link with subclinical thyroid disease and cardiac events, but what does that mean in the long term? Nobody's quite sure. And do we, if we treat or not, does it make a difference? Nobody is quite sure. It's often stated that subclinical thyroid disease affects mood, cognition, and this has been looked at in a rather poor and small study from the New England Journal. Uh, patients who were treated with thyroid hormone uh, versus those who were subclinical hypothyroid uh, over 12 weeks. A um, number of things were looked at in this particular study, and basically the long and the short was that working memory didn't appear to be quite as sharp in those patients with subclinical disease versus those that were treated, uh, but, never, uh, but the results at best were subtle. But nevertheless, there is this question out there that mood uh, status may be affected by subclinical disease. There's very few studies we have that actually look at this. Um, I can tell you from the clinical perspective, because I see a lot of this, is that I do believe that with the TSH in the 5 to 10, most folks do feel well, but they feel better once they're treated. I've had this uh, comment given to me many times in the past by patients, gosh, I felt good, but I feel so much better now that, that TSH is down around 2 where it belongs. Um, now, what about the, the big key here, though, one of the big worries that we have as endocrinologists is this. What happens in the future to these people with subclinical thyroid disease? And there was an interesting study in one of our endocrine journals about 15 years ago that addressed this, and I haven't found a study yet that is, is shows it any better than this did. And basically, this was a population of people that were all antibody positive, and a TSH was measured and followed over time. And we're talking, by time, I'm talking 20 years these patients were followed. Those that were antibody positive, TPO, antimicrosomal, uh, with a TSH that was normal, one in four of them, 20 years later, had overt hypothyroidism. This wasn't, obvious, this wasn't subtle disease, this was overt uh, clinical hypothyroidism. But those that had a TSH in the 5 to 10 range, almost uh, over half of those individuals, almost 60%, were overtly hypothyroid. So this is a big concern. Here's subclinical disease in the patients who are at a, a risk for it, which is with Hashimoto's, developing overt disease within 20 years and all of the problems that come with overt disease. So we look at this, and I look at this, and my partners look at it and, and uh, look at it and say, why wait 20 years for obvious disease to develop 
When I've got something I can fix now in these patients that is safe, it's inexpensive, if used properly, there are no side effects to thyroid hormones, so why should we wait 20 years for this patient to get sick? Uh, Follow-up uh, gets lost in a lot of these folks, so uh, this, I think, is the biggest argument in my mind to consider treating patients with uh, subclinical hypothyroidism. Now, because of all of these uh, uh, reports and literature, and I could show you study after study after study, and no one study says clearly yes, no one study says clearly no. And I love working on the Mayo system, because within our system, there's a total of almost 50 endocrinologists, 40 of whom reside up in Rochester. Of those 40, seven or eight of them do nothing but thyroid disease. That's all their whole professional career. All they've done is clinical uh, research education in terms of thyroid. So back in 2004, there was a blue ribbon panel that was struck with thyroidologists around the world. And one of those was one of the thyroid uh, folks from the thyroid core group up in Rochester. And this panel got together and published in JAMA in 2004 now, looking at all of these studies, trying to decide should we treat or not. And they basically said that the benefits of treatment are not clearly documented, the consequences of subclinical disease are not clearly known, and the, the, this particular panel said, no, uh, don't treat. We do not need to treat subclinical hypothyroidism. With exception, pregnancy. We cannot let subclinical hypothyroidism go in pregnancy. That could be disastrous to the fetus. Women over the age of 60, because this is so common, it was felt we probably should consider treatment. And those at risk for thyroid dysfunction, otherwise folks who are antibody positive, if they've got a goiter, we probably should consider treatment. But across the board, for the majority of patients, this particular panel said, no, I don't think we need to, we need to be concerned with the TSH in the 5 to 10 range. Beyond 10, different story, but in 5 to 10, uh, we probably don't need to treat. Now, that same year, in one of our endocrine journals, there was another panel, an expert opinion panel put together with the Endocrine Society, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, American Thyroid Association, same sort of concept, pull experts together, send them down and bang this issue out. And another uh, endocrinologist from our system uh, was, was part of this particular panel. And they had, this panel felt that subclinical disease is a continuum of disease, and the pa most patients in the five to 10 range we probably should treat using our clinical judgment. Uh, you know, obviously, they're very elderly, have heart problems, we're not going to, but in the majority of patients, we probably should treat. And they, like the previous panel, all agreed that if TSH is over 10, we definitely should treat. So now we've got two opinions, two panels put together with thyroidologists from around the world, two of whom were within our system, each sat on the opposite side of the fence, and they came up with different conclusions. So it's, it's perplexing, it's tough, you know, uh, what do we do with these patients? Obviously we don't want to over-treat them. So I'm left then as a troop in the trench trying to decide what to do given all of these conflicting opinions and given these studies that are out there. So what do I do? I don't know if this is right or it's wrong, but this is what I've done through the years and actually this is what most of my partners do as well. When do we treat? If lipids are elevated, uh, clear, uh, we, you know, if lipids are up, we can lower them by putting patients uh, on thyroid hormone. If they have mood changes, if they're depressed, I consider this a, an indication to go ahead and treat. If antibodies are positive, in my mind, an absolute indication to treat because I don't want them to develop uh, overt disease somewhere down the line. If they have a goiter, again, that would be, in my mind, a, a reasonable indication to treat. Or if they're gonna be a problem in terms of following up uh, further down the line, we probably should go ahead and treat. I don't know if these recommendations are right or wrong, but when you add it all up, I err on the side of treating most of the patients I see. And the reason I do is that it's safe, it's cheap, there are no side effects so long as we don't over-treat and give too much thyroid hormone, and then I don't have to fuss with worry about this patient becoming hypothyroid further down the line. It's a very easy treatment to undertake. You don't need to follow thyroid levels uh, every three or four months once the patient lands on the right dose of thyroid. Once a year is all you have to check that TSH. So in my own practice, this is generally uh, when, when I treat. I don't know if it's right or it's wrong, but I've shown you the arguments on both sides uh, with the previous, uh, previous slides. Now, let's flip the coin over and talk about hyperthyroidism. But before going on to subclinical hyperthyroidism, I want to backtrack a bit, digress, and talk about hyperthyroidism in general, because it's a lot more complicated than hypothyroidism. And when we look at hyperthyroidism kind of in general, what mechanisms, there's only two ways a patient can become hyperthyroid, as long as they're not taking too much thyroid hormone. 
Either one, the gland itself is endogenously producing too much thyroid hormone, Graves' disease, toxic nodular goiter, hot nodule. The gland itself is inherently abnormal, producing too much thyroid hormone. Or the gland is breaking down and releasing thyroid hormone. That little butterfly that sits in your neck contains about 50 days of stored thyroid hormone. So if TSH is suddenly cut off, the gland itself uh, does have a lot of, of or uh, for whatever reason, uh, TSH is interfered with. There's a gland itself has a lot of ability to, to put thyroid out. If that gland is damaged, a subacute thyroiditis, or if the membrane is broken down, we can release stored hormone and you end up with uh, either w with hyperthyroidism. Either way, you become hyperthyroid. Either the gland isn't producing too much or it's leaking too much. And there is one study that I'll show you that will distinguish between these two broad categories of, of hyperthyroidism. So once that patient, you've got a diagnosis of hyperthyroidism, what do we do next to try and delineate what's causing the hyperthyroidism? Uh, two tests really uh, come to mind. One is a thyroid uptake, and two is a thyroid scan. Now when I'm talking to residents, and as patients presenting hyperthyroidism, I say, what's your next test? The TSH is suppressed, T4 is high. What are you going to get? 99.9% .9 of the residents will say, I want an uptake scan. And he says, well, that's fine, but what do you really want? I want an uptake scan. I say, wait, what do you want? And they keep going at it, and before they begin to realize that these are two words, uh, an uptake and a scan. And they're two different studies, and they give two different pieces of information. And this is frequently forgotten at the resident level. And this kind of forces them to think, what do you want, an uptake or a scan? Um, and the importance of this is, is going to become apparent. An uptake, we give a small tracer, Y123, I131, a small dose of it, and you just put a camera over the neck four hours later, you put a collimator over the neck again 24 hours later, and you measure how much of it has been taken up into the thyroid gland. Normal uh, in, uh, in our country, some are around 15 to 16 percent at four to six hours uh, or less. At 24 hours, around 28, 29 percent or less. This is what we see that's taken up into the gland. So when you scan that, or when you get the, put the scanner over it, you're getting a number that comes out, and it gives you a value. It tells you here, X percentage at four hours, X percentage at 24 hours. This particular individual, T TSH was suppressed, their four hour value was elevated, their 24 hour value was elevated. So it gives you a number. It's an index of thyroid function. It tells you that that gland is overactive endogenously. So thyroid uptake equals thyroid function. We see it elevated up in patients with Graves' disease, multinodular goiter, a hot nodule, occasionally hashitoxicosis. These folks are going to have a, an uptake at the upper limits of normal or elevated. In those patients that have breakdown of the thyroid, the gland is not capable of taking in the radioactive iodine. It's going to be suppressed near zero. And this is where we see with the subacute thyroiditis, if the patient has a lot of iodine on board, if they've had CT contrast or they're taking iodine supplements, uh, the iodine pool is expanded, you give them a small tracer dose, it looks like they're not taking anything up in the neck. But this one study, the uptake will split endogenous thyroid production versus leakage uh, hyperthyroidism. Uh, hyperthyroidism, very important test to distinguish those two broad categories because treatment is entirely different depending on what you have. Thyroid scan, on the other hand, gives you a pretty picture. It tells you about thyroid anatomy. It doesn't tell you anything about thyroid function. And this is just a standard, uh, and again, I-123 or I-131 is used nowadays more often, I-123. Uh, but it's just, it's a true scan. It gives you a true picture. If there's a cold nodule in there, you'll see it on the scan. If there's a hot nodule or functional, you'll see it on the scan. But this gives you a picture. That's all it does. It doesn't give you any information about thyroid function. I've already talked to you about this one, what's up, and again, with the thyroid toxicosis with zero or near zero radioactive iodine uptake, uh, this is what you're looking at. Uh, most often, it's exogenous. I, obviously, if they're taking thyroid hormone, they're not going to take anything up in the neck, but the inflammatory destructive uh, thyroiditis, this test will make your diagnosis for you. And this is what we ski if we were to scan those people, nothing. Uh, they won't see anything on it because they haven't taken up the scanning material. So turning now to subclinical hyperthyroidism, to get away from hyperthyroidism as, as a whole and now talk about subclinical hyperthyroidism, what is it? Again, it's the asymptomatic individual. They feel well. They look well. You would never pick it up looking at them in the, on physical exam. Their T4 level, free T4, T3, T7, whatever you're measuring otherwise, is completely normal. And they have a suppressed TSH. TSH of less than 0.1, diagnostic of hyperthyroidism. 
in the 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 so-called gray zone, and that sometimes is a real tough one to sort out. But these are folks who feel well, look well, that second lady that we put up for the question a little bit earlier. Unlike hypothyroidism where the TSH is elevated, in elevated TSH there's really only two major conditions that are going to do that, hypothyroidism or a TSH secreting pituitary tumor, which is rare enough to forget about. But a low TSH, other things can affect TSH and cause it to go down. And this is where it gets a little tougher to sort out in the subclinical patient, is something else affecting that TSH. If they're severely ill, a so-called sick youth thyroid patient, and where you see this is in the critical care unit, if they're desperately ill on a medical or surgical unit, I mean very sick people, they'll have a suppressed TSH and frequently will have a suppressed free T4 as well. It doesn't carry with it, it does not need to be treated, but it is one of the things that will cause a low TSH. Obviously, if they don't have a pituitary, if they've got a big pituitary tumor, that's going to interfere with TSH production. If they're taking thyroid hormone, and you can be fooled here, if a patient is taking thyroid and you're not thinking about it, their TSH is going to be suppressed, they deny taking it, you can measure a thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin is uh, uh, present in the, in the, uh, in the uh, presence of somebody taking thyroid hormone gives you a lot of useful information. But you can also be fooled with a drug like Cytomel, which is T3. And I have seen surreptitious use of T3. You measure a T4 level in those folks, it's low. You measure a TSH, it's low. You're scratching your head trying to figure out if the sick youth thyroid is or something else odd here that's going on. Measure a T3. And a T3 is elevated, you've got your diagnosis. Here's a patient who's surreptitiously taking Cytomel. So obviously, if they're taking thyroid, that's going to affect TSH production. Amiodarone. The endocrinologists hate amiodarone because amiodarone-induced hyperthyroidism is one of the toughest forms of thyroid to treat. Cardiologists use it like candy, and we get stuck with the thyroid end effects. Dopamine, again, in the ICU setting, or dobutamine, all of which will lower TSH. Uh, even high-dose steroid therapy will lower TSH to some extent. And if they're recovering from hyperthyroidism, a patient with Graves that I've treated, it may take two or three months for that TSH to finally kick in and start functioning the way it's supposed to again. So recovery from hyperthyroidism, you can frequently see a TSH that's suppressed with a free T4 that's doing what it should be doing. But these are some of the things that will affect TSH outside of, of uh, uh, hyperthyroidism from a thyroid-related issue. When you look at all causes of subclinical hyperthyroidism, by far number one is us, exogenous. We're giving the patient too much thyroid hormone. Multinodular goiters or an autonomous nodule will do it, Graves' disease, the subacute uh, thyroiditis, the painless thyroiditis, hyperemesis gravidarum, picking up uh, suppressed TSH in the first part of pregnancy with some, someone with hyperemesis can sometimes be a really difficult thing to sort out. But these are kind of the order of what's common and what's not common in terms of causing uh, subclinical hyperthyroidism. But number one is going to be exogenous. And in fact, when you look at the going to how common is subclinical hyperthyroidism, again, turning to that Colorado study uh, with uh, over 25,000 people, across the board, 2.1% of patients um, with a median age of 56 had subclinical hyperthyroidism. One in five, much like the ones that we were treating, we weren't giving enough, one in five of the ones we're treating, we're giving too much to. Um, so uh, we're part of the problem here in terms of over-treating or under-treating on both sides of the coin. You know, so what? Patient feels well, they look well, you've got some funny looking TSH values. Does that mean anything clinically? Yes, it means a lot clinically. In an absolutely classic study from the New England Journal, it was done in 1994 now, and I have yet to see it uh, reproduced as nicely as this study showed, looked at the 10-year cumulative incidence of atrial fibrillation in patients with uh, uh, subclinical thyroid disease. And over time, uh, in this particular cohort, uh, with the TSH that was normal over 10 years, less than 10% of them eventually ended up in one form or another with AFib. The TSH in that so-called gray zone, we start to see many more people who are having problems with atrial fibrillation, but patients with a TSH of less than 0.1 with subclinical disease had a very high incidence of atrial fibrillation, and all the issues that come with AFib, the embolic events, uh, and so forth. Not only that, but AFib from hyperthyroidism is a tougher one to deal with. They don't convert as easily. If they do convert, they frequently revert back to atrial fibrillation until the thyroid has dealt with, been dealt with. So there are consequences of subclinical hyperthyroidism in terms of the heart and rhythm disturbances, and I think those are well documented. 
And in fact, 20% of elderly patients with AFib will have subclinical hyperthyroidism. If you go looking for it, you're going to find it. Some will convert, some won't. Uh, the sad part, of course, is these folks get embolic events, and we can't help them once that's occurred. There are other things that occur at the level of the heart with subclinical thyroid disease that I won't go into. The heart rate tends to be up. PACs are more frequent. Uh, there's some interesting echocardiographic findings that we see, uh, all of which suggest that thyroid will impact the heart in a significant fashion over time. My own favorite is bone. What effect does thyroid hormone have on bone? And this has been looked at uh, with subclinical, again, subclinical disease in terms of bone. As the TSH falls, the risk of hip fracture rate rises. Subclinical patients with a TSH less than 0.1 do have significantly higher risk of hip fractures and vertebral fractures. So over time, a little bit of excess thyroid does hit the bone and does translate to fractures, which is what we see. But bear in mind that there is no increased risk of fracture if the patient is on normal thyroid levels. If that TSH is normal, there isn't an impact on fracture. It's only if the TSH is suppressed. And this is a common question I get from patients. While I'm taking my thyroid, is it going to hit my bones? No, as so long as I give you the right amount of thyroid, it's not going to impact your, your bone health. What about all-cause mortality and hyperthyroidism? And again, this has been looked at, published back in Lancet, 10-year uh, all-cause mortality in folks beyond the age of 60. 6% um, had uh, TSH of less than 0.5. It does appear that all-cause mortality is probably about two times greater than what we would expect in patients with subclinical disease. And this is primarily because of the cardiovascular issues that come with the, uh, with the subclinical disease with the hyperthyroidism. Uh, so I think it is safe to say that all-cause mortality, unlike the hypothyroidism, we do perhaps see an effect of a little bit of too much thyroid hormone over time. There's also been a question link of, of uh, subclinical hyperthyroidism with dementia, with Alzheimer's, and uh, there was a study published years ago now out of Rotterdam looking at this issue, and uh, did, did appear as though there was a slightly increased risk of dementia and Alzheimer's in patients with subclinical disease, but unfortunately, uh, this study didn't address whether or not treatment makes an effect. And in fact, all those other studies I gave to you don't address does treatment make an effect on this or not. Intuitively, we'd think it would, but those studies are still pending and still out there. In fact, what's missing from all of these studies, I've shown you cardiac data, bone data, all-cause mortality, uh, the dementia, Alzheimer's, is that I can't show you that fixing this is going to make any difference. You would certainly think that it would, and I can tell you anecdotally, I see this over and over, that we see less heart problems with patients in whom we fix it, uh, but I don't have good long-term studies that really show that treating this uh, is going to make any difference in terms of these end points. So going back to our panels, again, the same question was asked of our panels, and a consensus opinion on this was consider, in, in somebody with a TSH in the 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 range, consider just keeping an eye on them, but pretty much everybody. This panel and the previous one said the same thing. If that TSH is less than 0 0.1, get onto it. We need to treat these individuals. We need to identify what's going on. We need to treat them appropriately, particularly if it's something simple like us giving them too much thyroid hormone. We need to do something about it if that TSH is less than 0 0.1. And this one, all of the panels agreed on, thankfully. Now, once uh, you've decided to treat, what are you going to treat with? And to some extent, that depends on what the patient has. If it's exogenous, we just simply lower the thyroid dose, catch up to them a few months later, and keep getting the dose to where you want it to get that TSH where you want it. If it's a subacute thyroiditis or a painless thyroiditis, the patient has a breakdown in their thyroid gland and releasing stored hormone, all I'm going to give them is a beta blocker simply to look after the symptoms that these folks develop because it heals on its own. It gets better on its own over time if you give it the grace of time. You can't give these patients other antithyroid drugs because there isn't a thyroid there for it to effectively work on. So in this group of patients, I'll put them on beta blockers until the episode is resolved, and that may take two to four months. Uh, and similarly, patients with endogenous, with Graves' disease, most of them you're going to put on beta blockers because they also are going to be symptomatic. But those folks need to do something more definitive on. So what do we do? We've got radioactive iodine, and we can give big doses of radioactive iodine to ablate patients with Graves' disease, patients with multinodular goiters, patients with an autonomously hot nodule. Uh, this is an option we have, a uh, particularly popular one. We can give antithyroid drugs that block the synthesis of thyroid hormone and release of thyroid hormone. 
Propylthiuracil has pretty much fallen by the wayside now. We don't use it anymore except if the individual is pregnant. And the reason we don't is because of hepatic uh, dysfunction, hepatic problems that are now being described with PTU. So that one's pretty much fallen by the wayside. Methimazole or tapazole is a great way to, to treat um, uh, Graves' disease, for instance. The problem with these drugs is that 80% of the time when you stop them, there's going to be a recurrence of the hyperthyroidism. So patients are usually on them forever, uh, and the drugs carry with them side effects otherwise. They're rare, but they do pop up. It's actually interesting in this country, in North America, for Graves' disease, uh, and even for multinodular goiters that are overactive, most endocrinologists here will use radioactive iodine ablation in North America. In Europe, most will use uh, the antithyroid drugs, particularly methimazole. There's still fights across the pond as to who's right and who's wrong on this one, and clearly nobody's right or nobody's wrong because they both work and they work well if they're used properly. The reason that we don't like methimazole over here primarily is because the majority of patients are going to be on it for a long term and have potential side effects related to it. Whereas if you treat them with radioactive iodine, ablate and get rid of the thyroid, put them on thyroid hormone, it's a simple pill to take. Again, no side effects and it's easy to adjust. Is that right or wrong? You have to argue with the Europeans on that one. So I'm going to summarize here with uh, TSH, and this is a flow diagram which I generally don't like because nobody can remember them, but in this sense it, it kind of works. If your TSH is less than 0.1, I'm going to say this patient is probably hyperthyroid, be it overtly or subclinical. Get a total T4 or free T4 just to make sure that you're not missing a problem with the pituitary otherwise. And then you proceed on to an uptake plus or minus a scan. A scan, if you're not sure what you're feeling, an uptake will divide those two broad categories of hyperthyroidism. In that range, that so-called gray zone, 0.1 to 0.4, these folks are borderline. You again get a total or free T4, it should be normal on them, just to make sure you're not missing something funny with the pituitary. And you can consider an uptake or a scan, or you can consider just keeping an eye on them depending on what the clinical situation is. If the TSH is normal, and they have no other pituitary problems, if that individual's youth thyroid end of discussion, you don't need any further testing done. The TSH is elevated greater than five. Uh, again, uh, these folks are probably hypothyroid. Get a T4 because rarely you can have TSH secreting pituitary tumors. Those individuals have a high TSH and have a high T4 and are clinically hyperthyroid. Rare enough to forget about. I think I've seen it three times in my entire practice life. It's very, very uncommon. But uh, majority, if it's over five, they're hypothyroid. Your total T4, free T4 are going to be normal or low, confirms it, and then you have to decide in your own mind whether or not you're going to treat. So let's go back to those two individuals that we had a little earlier and ask the same question and see uh, if the patterns have changed as a result of what I've just told you. Completely asymptomatic lady, feels well, looks well, nothing to find. She comes into your office, subclinical hypothyroidism. Are we going to treat? Okay, now we're seeing a big shift. Before it was about a 50-50 split, now almost 70% of you say yes, you're going to treat. So it's interesting as I do this talk, and I'm not telling you one is right or wrong on this, uh, but in your own minds, uh, this is what you've decided, which, uh, which I would tend to agree with for the most part. So her sister wanders in the next day, flip side of the coin, TSH slightly suppressed, free T4 uh, is where it is, total T4 is, is normal. Now here you've seen a, a, a big shift, 57% prior said yes, we're going to treat, now it's 78% of you are going to treat, and again, it's something that I would tend to agree with. We'll go into questions here in just a second. Uh, but I think what I've done with this talk is I've seen a bit of a shift in terms of your approach to subclinical thyroid disease, and, uh, and, and this is what I've seen as I've done this before, is it presented balance both sides. Folks generally seem to err on the side of chasing this down.